Hey, so good to be able to welcome you today. We're in a series looking at the book of James. We've said that this is a book of the Bible that's been um, written by Jesus's younger brother, James, a member of his family, seen him grow up, his perfect brother, who uh, he didn't believe was the son of God. Uh, and yet he finds out later on that he is when Jesus appears to him alive from the dead. And then James goes on to become this incredibly influential leader in the early church in Jerusalem. And he writes out to some people after persecution has come to warn them uh, to be ready for trials, for temptations, for struggles that are going to come as a result of being under pressure but to hold on to God's promises throughout all of those things, that, that God's promises are gonna help us under pressure. Um, James is a very challenging book, it's very practical. There's not gonna be many bits of it. You're gonna baffle about what does that mean? You know, you don't have to dig that deep. It's like Mark Twain apparently once said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand that give me the trouble. So there's lots that you'll understand. The question then is, what are we going to do about it? And that hits home more than ever in today's reading from James chapter 1. James has been talking about trials, he's been talking about temptations, and now he says this. It's about listening and doing. My dear brothers and sisters, he says. So Christians have now become not just um, some people that he knows, they've become like family to him. That's what we want to get, this connection as family, the family of God. My dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. God wants to put a word, plant a word in you today, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I believe this is the word of God to us today and what you're going to do with it will make all the difference because he starts off by saying it's not about just hearing today and listening, it's about how we hear. Have you got an open heart as well as open ears? We've got to open our ears to hear what God wants to say to us. That would be my prayer for every one of us today, that we would be quick to listen. I want to be quick to listen. So often I'm very quick to speak, very quick to let out my thoughts and air my views. But he says, actually, we should be quick to listen, swift to listen to other people and to God as well. So we're quick to listen, but at the same time, slow to speak. The rabbis used to say, Two ears have been given to us, but only one mouth, and the tongue is walled in by the teeth, though the ears are open. See, this is the kind of Jewish wisdom that you're going to find all the way through the book of James, because he was writing as a Hebrew to Hebrews, and he's going to be bringing these very practical and challenging teachings to us. So, question, are you quick to listen? Am I, am I a person who's quick to listen? Are you slow to speak? That doesn't mean that you never speak. It just means that we weigh our words because we recognise that our words have weight. Every one of us has possibility to be able to help or harm situations. I love a thing that was written many years ago by a guy called Alan Redpath, and he, he put the acronym, think, before I speak, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? 
Is it kind? If not, check yourself before you wreck yourself or somebody else or destroy a relationship by just wanting to have your say. Be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. Literally the word there is like slow to bubble up. Like when you get under the heat, you can have a pan and it's just like ready to go anytime. Perhaps in the times in which we're living right now, the pressure that we're under, sometimes it can feel like things are just ready to bubble up and to blow over and to, to blast out to everybody else around us. But he, he says, here's the reason why you, you need to be, we need to be slow to become angry. He says, because the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. And literally, the word there is the anger of a man. He's not, he's talking, he didn't, there's a different word he could have used to the anger of men and women, but he's talking about this thing. And I think it is in a lot of us men that just makes us short tempered, short fused, and uh, willing to very much excuse ourselves for the fact that, well, that's just the way I am. And uh, actually, we need to be better than that. We need to be the person that God created us to be. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. I remember years ago, Eric Dell that I used to work with, who was like a mentor to me as well as being the first person I ever heard preach the gospel. I worked with him for a few years and after a bit, he said to me, I need to tell you about something. He said, sometimes in meetings, you come across as a bit angry and you need to watch that. And if there's anything that I've heard and I've had to remind myself of over the years, it's been that. That to me is a besetting sin. It's something I have to watch. In my previous church, two guys that I really trust they got me together and they kind of railroaded me into a conversation and they said to me, you know, maybe it used to work for you in the police to be able to turn on the anger switch to be able to get what you need. Uh, but you need to know you're not going to be able to be the leader that God wants you to be because what's happening is there's times when you just, you let your anger out in, 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 in wrong ways. And uh, I think it's better, but it's still not sorted. This is an area in which I need God's help. I remember going back from that and saying to Zoe, do you know what? This is amazing. They're so kind. M Martin and Glenn just told me this thing and, and told me this thing and, I'm, and, and uh, you know, I'm really going to have to think about it. And I remember Zoe laughing and then said, well, she didn't laugh actually. She just said, all these years I've been saying that to you and you've not been listening and then they say it to you and now you're going to do something about it. So the fact is my anger doesn't bring about what God wants in the end. Well, I might get what I want, but it won't be what God wants. So he says, We've got to get rid, literally the word there is like take off all moral filth. And he's like dirty clothes that you've been wearing, take them off and the evil that is so prevalent. It's like at the moment people are going out in this world that feels a bit contaminated. And you know, recently I went on to a COVID ward near to one of those to be able to pray for somebody. And um, when I came home, all the clothes were just straight in the washing in, on a hot boil. And I actually ruined some clothes because they were on the wrong temperature. And, and people who are working in these environments know you can be contaminated by proximity to things. So he says, just get rid of stuff that's going to stain you and mess you up. And the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted in you. See, there's a very famous passage that Jesus talks about, the parable of the sower. And he said that a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. What did the good soil produce? It produced a crop. It did something. You could tell something happened. You can tell that the word, the seed went in because something was produced. It produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ear, Jesus said, let him hear. So just because you've got ears doesn't mean that you're hearing. And he goes on to talk about that really clearly. I don't want to be, I wonder sometimes what we can do, maybe the reason he's talked about these tests, these trials we go through is because have you ever been like um, maybe for work or, or on a course and you kind of find out that actually they're never going to test you in it? So, you, you know, just, it's, this is just a lot of information that you can hear, but there's never going to be a test of it. How engaged are you with that? Well, very often, if you know there's not going to be a test, if you know it's not going to be on the test, we can kind of just close off and zone out. I've done that. 
But if I know there's a test coming up, then I'm gonna prick my ears up, I'm gonna take notes, I'm gonna make sure that I don't miss it because I know there's gonna be a test. So he's been warning us about the tests of life and he's saying that the word of God, switch on to it because it's gonna help you to get through these different tests that you go through. He says, don't deceive yourself just by listening to the word, do what it says actually do something with it. What did you do with last week's word? Do you remember last week? I talked about the source of temptation. I talked about the seduction of temptation. And I talked about the solution of temptation. Encourage people to pray a prayer and say, Lord, I want you to be the solution and help me to be able to resist temptation and give me that new life and that new birth. Did you do that? I asked people, would you let us know whether you've done that? It's been delightful this week. We've had people emailing in to say, yes, I prayed that prayer. It, this is the result of it. We've had people messaging to say that through the week. If you did that, let us know. We want to rejoice with you and pray about it. But it's also not so I'll know, but so that you will know that you're doing something with the word of God. And every one of us, whether you've been a Christian for years, a Christ follower for years or not, we can't afford to deceive ourselves by thinking that we can just sit through talks anymore and listen to them and, and kind of ponder them, but do nothing about them. James is like, wake up to that. Open your ears. And then he says um, that we need to close our mouths, hold our tongues, watch what we say, and control our emotions, watch our anger, and take out the rubbish, throw that stuff out, and do the word, do what the word says. It says if we don't do those things, then really we're like somebody, you know, the other week I looked, and I, and I went, looked in the mirror, and I had this incredible, like, hair that had grown out of my nose it was like I was like is that really there I was looking around I was trying to see it it was like just came out of here and like you know and as I got close it was like a rhino basically I had like a horn growing out of it and I was like I tried to you know I was like what can I do with it and to pull on the thing to get it out it's like nobody ever told me things like that would grow out of your face it was horrible and it was it was quite a struggle to get rid of it I have to say but imagine if I just looked in the mirror and then thought, oh, I've got this rhino hair growing out of my nose. It looks awful. What am I going to do? Oh, well. And then just walked away without having done anything about it. That's the picture he's using. In the Bible times, they wouldn't have had a mirror like we would have had, made of glass. They would have had, like, made out of copper or, or something. And they would just look at the reflection and, and, and be able to work out what's working and what's not working. He says, but you'd have to look intently into it, he says, to be able to do that. He says, and, and the word that look, about looking intently, it literally means lean in. Are you leaning in to what God's saying? Into the perfect law? Are you peering into these things? People sometimes say to me, well, how come I can read that passage of the Bible and really it just skims over me and I get nothing out of it? And I hear you speak and it's like, you know, you bring a lot of out, out of it. The reason I bring a lot out of it is because I look a lot deeper into it. It's because I lean intently into it. I do some study of it. I pray and I ask God and I read around it and I think, what does that word mean? And how does that apply to me? What's God? God, you're speaking to me. What are you saying? In the beginning of this Bible, this one that I'm reading, it's my oldest Bible, really, the one that I use the most, I've written in this thing about what I believe the Word of God to be. This is what I believe about the Word of God. I'll read it to you. This is on the first page of this Bible. It says, This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to strengthen you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveller's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Read it with faith, frequently, prayerfully. Follow it, and it will lead to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to the resurrected life in Christ, and yes, to glory itself for eternity. But even before that, on the very first flyleaf in here, I've written these words. It's talking to me. It's talking about me. Yes, of course it was talking to people in James's day of, through this. And when I see it like that, it gives me freedom, it says. If I keep on doing that, if I continue to do that, if I don't just forget what I've heard, and that's why I say, take notes, write things down, underline in your Bible. 
You know, but it isn't just, be, just because I, I colour in the Bible doesn't mean it's actually bringing any new life to my life. It's great to do that, but at the end of the day, it's about not forgetting. It, the literal word there is abiding in the word, living it through. If we do that, he says, we will be blessed in what we do, not in just hearing. There's no big credit from God by you sitting and listening to another five minutes of me talking. The question is, are you engaging with this? What, what's it making you think? What's it going to make you do differently as a result of this time with God's word? He gives a very practical and quite a stinging accusation to some people who would have thought themselves good people and religious people who were doing all the right things, who were paying their tithes, who were um, uh, going to the services and all those kind of things. He says, listen, you can do all of that, but if anybody considers himself religious and doesn't keep a tight right rein on their tongue, if you don't watch your mouth, and then watch out. It's like, that's a really good telltale sign. One of the things doctors will do to check out the health of your body, first thing, open your mouth and say, ah, they want to check your tongue. What's coming out of our mouths is reflecting what's going on in our hearts. And he says, if we, the Bible says another thing about the reign, the reign of God. God says, do not be like the horse or the mule that has no understanding, but has to be uh, restrained by a bit and bridle or it will not come to you. I myself will watch over you with my eye upon you. It's like God saying, I want to personally direct you. I don't want to have to restrain you and stop you. Restrain your tongue. Think about your words before you speak to them and then receive God's words and let them change you from the inside out. And then he says, the religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, two things. To look after orphans, or literally fatherless, and widows in their distress. Now, you would think, well, that's interesting. Why would he, out of all the th things that we could do, why would he pick those things? I'll tell you why. Because, it, because it, 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 it's going to cost us to do that. In terms of compassion, yes. In terms of empathy, yes. But actually, in terms of time. There's, there's all kinds of things that, that we could do. But to, to care for other people costs me the, probably the most important thing that I've got, which is my time. To be able to go out of my way to be able to help other people and, and to empathise with them and to step in and do what I can to be able to care for those people. God says that's what really matters most to him. To take care of other people is like number one for God. And then secondly, he says to keep oneself from being polluted or spotted or, or stained by the world. And again, that was the thing when you go into these uh, wards where they've got hygiene control in place and they have all of the gloves and all of the gowns and all of the masks and all those things. They recognise that there's stuff out in the world there. Maybe you can't even see it, but it's going to spoil you. It's going to stain you. And he says, keep yourself from those things. Be aware of what you look at. Be aware of what you listen to. Be aware of the company that you keep and, and be aware that all these things can pollute us if we're not careful. There's an old phrase for that. You've probably heard it before. Be in the world, but not of the world. And both matter. We want to be in the world. There's so many things that Ivy people are involved in right now in the world. There's lists of things that I, I just asked for a, a sample of a few of the lists of the things that Ivy people have got involved with to be able to make a difference, not just in this, well, it's an ongoing thing, but, but especially in this crisis. And this was just the ones that we know about. And you, I'm sure, in different sites in different ways could add to them. And, and many of these things, I'm not talking about the staff team doing them, although we're doing our best. We're on about the people of God, being the people of God in the world. But also, as well as that, We've got incredible people who are praying, who are asking God, Lord, would you change this situation? Stepping above the earthly reality and seeing what God's doing in their heavenly realities and praying, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. We don't want to just be ruled by the spirit of the age and by the principalities and powers and all of those things that are down here, Lord. We want to see above that and we want to pray kingdom come let your kingdom come here on heaven in, here, here on earth as it is in heaven and, and we want to be doing that too we don't want it, we want to be in the world but not of the world so we can affect the world so that we can change the world for Jesus Christ and th so many of these things are things that you could be involved with too because we don't want you to just be doers or to be just be hearers of the word we want to be doers of the word we want to do something about it what are you going to do about what you've heard today what are you going to do? Well, 
One thing that we're now about to move into, we're going to have some worship, we're going to do some other things together that will help us to be able to prepare uh, our hearts for being in the world but not of the world. We're going to get above our, our own situation by worshipping the Lord and focusing in connection of him. We want to have an out of this world time in worship. But then we also want to think about ways that we can be involved in the world and making a difference. And, and there's opportunities for you to be able to connect with us so you can help in those. But one more thing, it started out, it just made me think when I read this, that it says that we should be in the world. So he said, he said we should uh, listen, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Sometimes I'm very fast to speak and uh, I wanted to have an opportunity to listen. So on our slido.com channel, hashtag Ivy Church, you can go on there and ask us a question. I want you to go on and during the rest of the time, we're going to come back to this and spend a little bit of time at the end, just answering a few of the questions. You can even vote for the questions that you think are the best ones. But ask me something. Ask me about the book of James. Ask me something that you don't understand about God or about why we believe what we believe or what about this or what are we going to do about that or how can I be involved in this? And, and just want some connection and some communication with you as community together. Whether you're new here completely to this or you've been coming along for a long time, why not go on Slido and ask your question and we'll, be, we'll vote on them and you can pick on them and a few of them I'll be able to answer and then we'll be able to look even further at them in other ways before we finish today. So I want to invite you to do that. Go to slido.com and then hashtag Ivy Church and, and put in your question. What it is that it's been, it's, what's been the question? If there's a question especially that's been stopping you doing something for God, what, what would that be? If there's something that, that you just don't get, but you kind of think, if I could get that resolved, then I could really be even more full on in my, in my working for God in the world and relating to him and making a difference to my world that he's put me in. So ask us, I'm not saying we've got all the answers, but at least we can have a go and begin to do that. So thanks for listening and uh, let's be swift to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry and let the word of God do its work in your life and mine this week and always. And don't forget, get right now onto Slido and um, ask your questions. Wasn't that interesting and exciting that we had all kinds of issues coming on, but let's give it up wherever you are for Dan and Dave, uh, technical genius people who have helped us to get back on track. They've done so much amazing stuff. You know, Dave's just done a 24 hour thing with LZ7 for Dave Clark and for Open Arms and all of that. So. Um, it, it, it's just been amazing how these guys are working and working for us now. They've stepped up even more for us. They've always been brilliant servants, but for them to step up even more in these times and help us out is awesome. So when you write in a card of encouragement, when you're thinking of somebody you can bless, do send them money, chocolate, and thanks. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I've got this um, so you can see it. And we were talking before about how they didn't have mirrors like this, but this is a challenge for the kids. You can do it now and you can do it right the way through as you go into the site leader, uh, into the site led uh, things afterwards too, um, is to get a piece of paper, draw a frame around it and then do a self portrait. Do a picture of yourself in it and then um, write all over it or around it. What does God say about you? Sometimes we look in the mirror and we have our own thoughts about what I'm like. But what about writing around it, writing over it? Some of the things perhaps the parents and carers can help you to look in the Bible and to be able to say, what are the things that, that God would say about me? Because those are the truth. And, um, and so we, uh, that's the challenge now for the children, maybe young people, you can do that too. Actually, you know what, some of the, some of the adults, um, maybe you can also draw a picture. What a great way to connect with God and then to be able to write over. Take some time today, make it, as good as you can do it because you know there's no such thing that a child of God would ever do a piece of art and he'd say that's no good so draw yourself and then write in from the perfect word of God the things that he says about you now some people have been on Slido and have been asking some questions I'm going to try and wrap a few of those uh, into one uh, initially there's a, a few that came in around uh, James talks a lot about human anger. I talked about the anger of a man. He's saying, is it okay then uh, that Christians can have godly anger? What is godly anger? Or, um, or, or what is it that basically, is there a place for any anger in these times, Gordon asks. And, you know, there's things that we could look at in the world right now and get angry about. 
that I would think God would say that's not right. And we can share in that. We, and, and uh, you know, the Bible is a very human book as well as the divinely inspired book. And it, and it helps us to know what we're like. Later on in James, he's going to say, none of us are perfect. Isn't that great to have that in the Bible? No, none of us is perfect. Um, but right here, he says, he doesn't say you, you mustn't be angry or you're never going to be angry. But what about slow? What can we do to become slow to anger? Just to press pause a little bit. I think that's probably what, it, what, I, what I'm, I need to do. It's great, actually. Zoe can be like the Holy Spirit in my life sometimes when we're driving along in the car. And then absolute ah, will come and cut me up and then driving like crazy down the road and cutting me up and carving me up. And I'll be like, oh, idiot. Oh, I want to honk the horn and wish I was back in the police and then I could, you know, get the blue light after him and do all of that. And, and, and then Zoe just says, well, you, you never know. He could be like rushing his child to hospital right now. He could be doing something. You, you don't know what is going on in that person's life. And very often, the people that I might be angry with, they, they've got a sadness. They've got uh, an issue. They've got insecurities. They've got their problems, and I've got mine. And actually, to be able to think like that and to recognize these are people, not just issues. Lynn Swart used to have a sign-up that basically talks about, it said, you know, issues... Um, are you know you can deal with, but but relationships really matter most, and I think that's for for me to hold on to. That yeah, I think as I've said that it's okay to be angry about the things that, that God is angry about. I get angry when I look at uh, how I, I I see things. There's there's a charity the other day on Facebook that was putting something out that was saying about please could you donate something to help starving people in the Yemen. And then immediately there was all these people who came on on Facebook who were all saying, we need to be looking after our own. Charity begins at home. And, uh, you know, who, and uh, it's up to them. You know, they've started their own wars and we keep sending money to them and nothing ever changes. And I, I have to say, that angers me. Because when people say charity begins at home, usually that's exactly where it stays. It never gets outside the door. And I just think, I, and I, and I think actually, wow. What, what's happened in your heart that it would be so small that you could think about that and not want to change? I get angry when I look at global injustice, but then as somebody said, put something on the other day on my Facebook about how much wealth Jeff Bezos has got on Amazon. And it is unbelievable. It's inconceivable amounts of money that he's got. But then I read this passage and, and Martin Pye got commented on and said, yeah, but you know, for many of those people in those parts of the world, I'm Jeff Bezos. I'm somebody who actually could help them too. I'm somebody who they would, I would have indescribable, inconceivable amounts of money as well. So yeah, maybe I need to get a little bit angrier at myself in those ways <laughs> and, uh, and, and think what can I do to be more like God in those ways. Some other questions that are coming in. Um, how can I know that God loves me when I keep messing up? Um, you can know that because he, the Bible says, while we were still sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So before you were ever born, before you ever even had the opportunity to do anything wrong, God already loved you, forgave you, and did everything that's necessary for you to have an eternal, everlasting relationship with him. This is not about, uh, if I, sometimes we can make it like, if I'm a good person, I try and do more and more good things, then God will love me, and then I do something wrong, and then it's like, oh no, I'm right back down to the bottom of that greasy pole again, I just slid right down to the bottom. But guess what? If you can see that actually we, we, we start at the top, and, and his grace keeps us there. And that's where he meets us at the cross, that when I come and I just confess, I can't do this by myself and connect with that plan, then no matter how many times I mess up, I know that he loved me before the foundation of the earth and that he chose me according to his purposes, not according to how good I was and according to his plans. So, you know, it's, it's really important for us to remember. Yeah, I get, still get cross. I'm still a work in progress. As, I, as it says there. So it, it's, um, you know, there's some uh, other questions that are coming in. And um, is there a place yet for anger? We've had that one. What can I do? What can we do? What can we say to fellow Christians who refuse to look out for people less fortunate because it makes them feel uncomfortable, says Ruth. Well, again, there's, there's something of that in this passage because he's talking about 
somebody who considers themselves religious, and obviously in those days he's writing to Jewish people, he's writing to people who might have become a Pharisee or a scribe or whatever, and they know all about what the Bible says, but we're not practicing it. And we could end up fooling ourselves by doing that. And I'm not sure, I've, I mean, I've never found that pointing out other people's lack of caring or lack of doing what God uh, says has ever really helped them to change their minds on it. But usually what I have to do is, is again, look in the mirror myself. And there's that whole thing about when you point the finger at one person, there's all these other fingers that are pointing back at me. So ultimately, I think I'd, I'd have to say, what is it that makes me feel uncomfortable? Um, because, you know, we all have things that, that we think are really, really important and passionate. I can be like this. There was a person in a previous church some years ago, and her thing was prison ministry. And she loved prison ministry, and God had used her so much in prison ministry. And she, and she sacrificed great deals of her time, energy, effort, and money to, to do with prisons ministry. But around her, anybody around her started to feel like you're not really a Christian, not a real one, not a good one unless you're involved in some way in prison ministry. So I think we've got to be aware of that and ultimately do your thing that is God's thing and let your light shine before other people. But then let's not be looking around at other people necessarily and pointing out um, what they're doing because you don't know what they're doing. That's the other thing. I could think, well, well, nobody's doing anything around here. And then I find out actually loads of people are doing loads of things, really self-sacrificially, but maybe they're just not trumpeting it like other people are. Maybe they're just uh, actually not letting the right hand know what the left hand's doing. And so well, let's give each other a little bit of grace on that, especially in these times, perhaps. We need more grace. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let me have a look again. Opening the wrong thing. Uh, you mentioned you're a work in progress, as we all are. I thought he was going to say, as we all know, which is true also. <laughs> what exercises or disciplines do you use to develop? I think I think it's a bit like if I'm if I have a problem with um, with being with loving money too much, the antidote to that is the opposite spirit and is to give. So in the same way with with regard to anger, the, the opposite of that is I suppose patience. So sometimes putting myself in a position where I'm forced to be patient is a spiritual discipline. It's a very spiritual thing to do. Um, so it's like uh, I remember John Ortberg saying that that you know if you're the kind of person who gets cross and you're looking around in the, in the supermarket and you see that person's definitely got more than 10 items in their basket and it gets you really cross and you just want to get in there and get out. Actually go and get in the longest lane and sit, stand there and pray and, and talk to God and use that as an opportunity. We've been talking about these trials, the tests that we go through and how they can help us, uh, how we can kind of, um, in the end, grow where we stretched. Last one I'm going to do, there's some great questions, maybe we can do this again. If you, if you like this idea of having some Q&A and all these kind of things, then let us know, Facebook, let us know, because we want to be interactive with you. Um, so tell us what you think, maybe when you go on the site things, uh, you can also do that. So we're just going to uh, do one more thing. What is the law that James refers to in James 1, in chapter 1 verse 25, why is it perfect? What's the law? Well, again, he's a Jewish believer in his brother, older brother Jesus, now he's resurrected, speaking at this point to his fellow believers. They were working out what it was to be a Christian. So the law that they had was the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament because they were, they were writing the New Testament, I suppose, without even knowing it. You know, he's writing a letter to all these people. And at some point, hundreds of years later, people have taken that letter and said, this is from an apostle. This is somebody so close to the sources. This is, this is uh, Jesus's own brother writing these things to these early churches. So this is the word of God to us. And they tested it and made sure that it was. So it became part of the Bible for us. By the time, the law that he's talking about would be the Torah. It would be the the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And the Jewish people uh, have this incredible emphasis on those five books of the Bible, the first five. If you've never read the Old Testament, you've never read it, the, the, then I don't know how you can be a Christian if you don't spend some time in those five books of the Bible, because they're the fun, foundational um, scriptures that, 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 uh, that everything else gets built on. Um, but then if you look in Hebrews, and Hebrews chapter, uh, let me just check, Hebrews chapter 8, I was just reading this this morning, um, he says in, in Hebrews, he says that, that 
God had a promise and he, and he quotes back to the, the Old Testament, but one day he was going to write his law in our hearts that you wouldn't need anybody else to be teaching you. But God himself would be and come inside of us and that he would, he would write the law on our hearts. And it wouldn't be written on uh, tablets of stone like Moses had, but he was going to engrave these things onto our hearts. So that we're in a transition time as we look in James, where people have realized that actually I can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, that his word can speak to me. And at the same time, he can even speak through me. That now I can have a now word from God, a prophetic word a rhema word is is a sometimes people talk about this like that that's the word for now but the way you get them the way you get those words for now is you just just reading it just reading it and reading it and reading it i just said that that passage came to mind because i read it this morning from hebrews chapter eight zoe and i every morning just as long as i can remember we read four five chapters of the bible a day first thing in the morning we set the world up by the word in the morning. And as a result of that, through the day, things just come to mind. There's, little, there's, a, there's a thing I was reading this morning about silver trumpets in, in the Old Testament. I looked at that and I thought, wow, that is an incredible leadership lesson contained in about six verses of the Bible that I could talk to you about for hours. There's so much in that word. But what you've got to do, like I said before, is you've got to lean in. It's no good skimming it. It's no good just oh, like, you know, reading it like any other book. Treat it like God is wanting to use you. The lively oracles of God is what the queen was told, the Bible is, when it was presented to her on her coronation. It says this is the most precious gift that this world, this world affords, the lively oracles of God. That was put in the queen's hands on the day she was crowned because that's what the word of God is to us. So I'm going to, I'd love to spend some more time on more questions. Maybe we'll do some more in the weeks ahead if, we, if that works, but... Right now, we're going to worship again, so I encourage you to stand. Do a picture, paint a picture. Um, the, the, let the word be your mirror, not just what you see in the mirror, the person in the mirror. What is it that God says about me? What does God want to say to me? He's speaking about you. He's speaking to you. So right now, what he's saying is, I love your worship. I love it when you turn your heart towards me and when you are fully devoted to me. So maybe you've never done that. This is a great opportunity for you to do that. As we sing these songs, even if you don't know it, give your heart back to him right where you are in this worship time. We've all messed up. None of us is perfect. We all have different problems in different ways, but we can come to him now as children before a heavenly father and we can worship him. So please stand up if you're able, wherever you are, and stretch out yourself before God and say, I'm offering myself back to you, everything that I am. And now I'm going to worship you with my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit. Everything belongs to you. Amen.